Psalm 102. Let me read the text, um, and then we will dive into the word this morning. Um, Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my distress. Incline your ear to me. Answer me speedily in the day when I call. For my days pass away like smoke, and my bones burn like a furnace. My heart is struck down like grass and has withered. I forget to eat my bread. Because of my loud groaning, my bones cling to my flesh. I am like a desert owl of the wilderness, like an owl of the waste places. I lie awake. I am like a lonely sparrow on the housetop. All the days my enemies taunt me. Those who deride me use my name for a curse. For I eat ashes like bread and mingle tears with my drink. Because of your indignation and anger, for you have taken me up and thrown me down. My days are like an evening shadow. I wither away like grass. But you, O Lord, are enthroned forever. You are remembered throughout all generations. You will arise and you will have pity on Zion. It is the time to favor her. The appointed time has come. For your servants hold her stones dear and have pity on her dust. Nations will fear the name of the Lord, and all the kings of the earth will fear your glory. For the Lord builds up Zion. He appears in his glory. He regards the prayer of the destitute and does not despise their prayer. Let this be recorded for a generation to come, so that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord, that he looked down from his holy height. From heaven the Lord looked at the earth to hear the groans of the prisoners, to set free those who were doomed to die, that they may declare in Zion the name of the Lord and in Jerusalem his praise. When peoples gather together in kingdoms to worship the Lord, he has broken my strength in mid-course. He has shortened my days. O oh my God, I say, take me not away in the midst of my days, you whose ears endures throughout all generations. Of old you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe, and they will pass away. But you are the same, and your years have no end. The children of your servants shall dwell secure. Their offspring shall be before you. Psalm 102. He was a young, still a teenager, when he was named the pastor of the famous Park Street Chapel in London. This church was famous because the greatest of all Puritan preachers had spoken from this pulpit. And at 19 years of age, this young man was now the pastor of the largest Baptist church in all of in the entire world. By the time he was 21, there were thousands who were attending his church service and many more that were turned away because there was no room in the sanctuary. His sermons were published on the front pages of the leading newspapers of England. The famous missionary David Livingston carried this young preacher's printed sermons in his coat pocket while he explored all of Africa. At the age of 22, he moved to Exeter Hall to accommodate the enormous crowds, but there was still not enough room. So one Sunday he announced that he was going to preach at the music hall in Surrey Gardens. And all of a sudden all hell broke loose in the church and in the city. Surrey Hall was where the opera performed, where circuses were staged. And Surrey Hall, there was beer that was served to these crowds that were there. And at best, this young pastor's ideas was audacious. At worst, it was scandalous. All across England, bishops and pastors rallied against this young preacher who would conduct gospel services in a hall where the devil entertained sinners, they said. Major newspapers began scathing editorials condemning him as a publicity-seeking sensationalist. And October 19, 1856, lines of horse carriages stretched back about seven to eight miles in massive traffic jams as countless thousands of people poured into Surrey Gardens. The music hall was packed with more than 7,000 people before the service even began. And as a young preacher got on stage getting ready to preach his message, 
someone decided to yell fire in the audience and panic-stricken people began to stampede through the exits. Seven were crushed to death. Twenty-eight others were injured critically. The young preacher was shaken and escorted out of the hall. And as he left, he saw corpses and twisted bodies laid out on the grass outside the hall. And he was escorted home in a daze. And when he saw his young wife at home, he collapsed and was carried to his bed. And that wasn't the worst of it. In the following weeks, in pulpits across England, sermons were preached that what happened at Surrey Hall was God's judgment on this preacher for holding evangelistic services on the devil's playground. The headlines and editorials in English newspapers were devastatingly cruel. For three weeks, this young preacher refused to get out of bed. He would suffer severe bouts of clinical depression for the rest of his life. I don't know if you're familiar with the names Charles Spurgeon, but if you're familiar with Christian history, you should be glad that Spurgeon eventually did get up out of bed. He overcame suicidal despair to eventually start a preacher's college, to open up a string of orphanages throughout England, to write some great hymns that we have sung in our church. At 23 years of age, Spurgeon ignored critics and held evangelistic services at Crystal Palace, the largest auditorium in England. On October 7, 1857, more than 24,000 filled that place. Up to that time, the largest crowd to ever hear one sermon. In 1861, when he was 27 years old, Spurgeon opened Metropolitan Tabernacle, which a worship center that could seat more than 6,000 people in a single service. It was the first megachurch in the history of the church. Spurgeon is called the Prince of Preachers. His sermons still touch the lives of people when they read it. Countless millions of people have been transformed by his ministry. And yet he suffered with depression for the rest of his life. And even though his sermons were full of humor, he once wrote that melancholy is my closest neighbor. One day he stood up to preach at church one morning and the scene of the tragedy at the music hall came to his mind and he got up and he said, my brother and I feel quite out of order for addressing you tonight. I feel extremely unwell, excessively heavy, incre increasingly depressed. And he sat down and the preacher never heard a message. He was unable to go on. There would be times when he would accomplish great things with great enthusiasm, only to fall into seasons and seasons of despair. If he was alive today, he would probably be labeled a manic depressant. Almost yearly, he would become so debilitated by depression that his elders would send him off to southern France for three months at a time just so that he could rest. The nightmare at Surrey Hall never stopped recurring in Spurgeon's mind, each time bringing fresh waves of despair into his life. And before he died at the age of 58, he was revered as the greatest preacher of his age. But he died so morbidly obese and suffering from gout, complicated by his bouts of depression. Spurgeon, one of the heroes of the Christian faith, a man that many, many preachers will look up to, many pastors will look up to because of his boldness to preach the gospel. Does it surprise you that someone who could preach so eloquently and preach so powerfully would suffer from chronic depression? See, our assumption is that if you're living a, if you're a follower of Jesus, then you should always be triumphantly happy. See, but the truth is, dark times have engulfed even the godliest of God's saints. On his 40th birthday, Martin Luther said that I'd rather, I'd sooner go to hell for eternity than to live 40 more years on this wretched earth. 
Job in the Old Testament asked God to let him die. David would write, I am feeble and utterly crushed. Elijah would beg God to take his life. Jonah would cry out, I just want to die. The prophet Jeremiah lamented, is there anyone to comfort my soul? And even Jesus, our Savior, would say, I'm overwhelmed to the point of death. The apostle Paul would write, I despaired of life itself. Listen, there's not a saint who hasn't gone through what St. John of the cross said, the dark night of the soul. And maybe you're going through such a dark night today. And this morning, the psalm that we read, the psalmist talks about dark times in his life. And over the course of the last several weeks, we've looked at various psalms that dealt with our emotions, talked about areas when we doubted whether God existed or God cared or God loved us. If you look at the psalm, if you look at the title, it says, this is a prayer of one afflicted when he is faint and he pours out his complaints before God. And if you see the psalm, the psalmist is brutally honest before God. He describes his despair in the most graphic of terms. See, those of us who have gone through dark times in our lives, we can relate to the words of the psalmist. Some of you who are going through dark times right now, let me encourage you, you can find hope in the words of the psalmist. Charles Spurgeon would often revisit Psalm 102 when he was going through the darkest seasons of his life. And if you want to summarize this entire psalm into one sentence, you could say this is the core principle that you find in this psalm. It's this, that healing comes when our focus is on God, not ourselves. Healing comes when our focus is on God, not ourselves. Despair always leads to self-absorption. If you read the first 11 verses of this psalm, this afflicted man is fixated by his own troubles. In the first 11 verses, there are three references to God, one reference to other people, but there are 24 references to himself. Three words you could see in monotonous repetition. There are the words I, the word me, and the word my. True healing doesn't begin until his lament, until his lament about his problems turns to his praise of God's person. See, so if you're going to understand Psalm 102, you need to understand healing. In his classic book, The problem of pain, C.S. Lewis once wrote that modern Christians have an immature view of pain. And about 70, 80 years after C.S. Lewis has written that book, I would say that us postmodern Christians, we're even more immature. We live in a narcissistic age when everything is about us. It's about our feelings, our needs, our wants, our happiness. For us, healing is about getting rid of the pain we feel. And yet for God, healing goes deeper than the localized pain that we feel to holistic healing. Body, soul, mind. It's not just about healing for us as individuals. It's about healing everything and everyone that we're networked with in our world. See, that means that God may use a sickness in your body to heal your soul. That means that God may use painful relationships to heal flaws in your character. That means God might use a Down syndrome baby in a family so that those whose lives touch that special child may be more healthier. He may use natural disasters or financial crises or wars to afflict nations so that people would repent and their countries would become healthy again. I was just speaking to a friend of mine who's got a six-month-old, and they diagnosed him with cancer. And the baby is going through chemo, and I texted him this week to see how he was doing, and he said, I've never sensed God's presence stronger in my life than through going through this time. I have been drawing closer to God, pleading with God, interceding with God, and I never felt his presence as strong as I felt during this time in my life. Abraham Lincoln was convinced that the Civil War was God's way of purging America of its sickness of slavery. 
After 14 years of suffering with a thorn in the flesh, St. Paul would say that he was glad that God didn't heal his physical pain so that he could give him a greater spiritual healing. See, in our immaturity, we want quick relief from the affliction we feel, but in God's sovereign grace, God wants, us to, give a, God wants to give us a more profound healing that we need in our lives, that we need in our families, that we need in our churches, that we need in our land. See, that's why Psalm 102 is so critical for us. And if in this psalm there are three points that the psalmist makes that are so vital for us to understand, three things that the psalmist talks about. Number one, he said that desperate prayers bring healings needed more than healing sought. Desperate prayers bring healings needed more than healing sought. See, again, the healing that we seek is not always the healing that we need. The affliction that drives us to desperate prayers is not always the sickness that is the most dangerous. Look at the urgency in verses 1 and 2 here. Hear my prayer, O God. Let my cry come to you. Don't hide your face from me in the day of my distress. Incline your ear to me. Answer me speedily in the day that I call. Do you see the desperation in his prayer here? There are five requests in six lines that are virtually identical. Hear my prayer. Let my cry come to you. Turn your ear to me. Answer me speedily. James Montgomery Boyce, a pastor in Philadelphia, writes, Desperate conditions make for strong petitions. See, this prayer of the psalmist cries from a broken-hearted Jew who saw the destruction of his beloved city. Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians. This Holocaust came because the Jews chased after other gods and other pursuits and pleasures. Their culture descended into gross immorality. Bigotry, injustice were rampant in the land. People pursued materialism and mindless entertainment. And for centuries, God sent prophets to warn his people of the coming apocalypse, but they lusted after their own pleasures and they ignored God and they chose to forsake God. They were sick in every single way and so God unleashed the Babylonians from what is modern-day Iraq and Iran. Listen, understand this. God didn't unleash the Babylonians just because he was ticked off and wanted to slap the Jewish people silly. That's not why he did it. He knew that his people were sick and they could only find healing in a passionate relationship with him. God was driving his people back toward him. See, too often when things go well in our life, we get spiritually lazy. Too often when everything's okay, we think it's because of our own doing. And the more we're disconnected from the source of our life, the sicker we become. And so God allows individuals and families and churches and nations to experience the painful consequences of spiritual neglect. For some of us, it takes a whole lot of affliction before we get desperate enough to run back to the lover and the healer of our souls. And only then does our prayer life take on the urgency of self-preservation. We begin to beg God for relief, but he knows that as quickly as we get relief, as quickly as he heals us, we'll be like the pig that returns back to the mud or the dog that returns back to the vomit. As desperate as our prayers are, we need a healing far deeper than the pain for which we are fixated on. And instead of bringing relief, sometimes God actually turns up the heat. Number two, desperate conditions birth great prayers. Desperate conditions birth great prayers. The opening of this prayer in verse 1 and 2 is necessary, but not great. He sees God as a fixer. He's demanding. He's like an immature child that's asking God to do this for him right now. It's all about him. It's all about his pain. God doesn't begrudge childish prayers. Sometimes panic is the only thing that drives us toward him. But we receive little from quick answers to prayer. I don't think this prayer was prayed in one setting. I see it as a sense of an evolution over days and months and years of praying through pain that just didn't go away overnight. And the prayer takes a dramatic change in verse 12, turning from focusing on himself to a focus on God. 
It goes from immaturity to maturity. But in between verses 2 and verse 12, there's this desperate struggle that this psalmist faces. Look at the phrases in these verses. Verse 3, my days pass like smoke. My bones burn like a furnace. My heart is struck down like grass. It's withered. I forget to eat bread. The afflicted man laments that he's been tossed on like a fire and that everything in his life is burning up like smoke. How many times have you felt like that? Or do you feel like grass that's been yanked up out of the earth, emotionally disconnected from everything that gave you life, and you're withering away in your dryness? No wonder he goes on in verse 4 to say, I forgot to eat my food. There are times when our senses are so dead that even food has lost its appeal. In verse 5, he says all he can do is groan. He's become like skin and bones. Emotional groaning leads, deteriorates our physical health. And with all of this comes the loneliness of despair. Look at the pity party in verses 6 through verse 10. Verse 6, he says, I'm like a desert owl of the wilderness, like a bird alone on the roof. And during those times, sleep doesn't even come. Verse 7, I lie awake. And then a kind of paranoia sets in when he thinks that others pity him or laugh at him or are talking about him. Verse 8, all day long my enemies taunt me. And then our heart breaks. Our broken hearts swell up in tears of self-pity. I eat ashes as food and mingle my drink with tears. We sink so deep that we think even God has abandoned us. Verse 10, your indignation and anger, you've taken me and thrown me down. And the spiral goes to its ultimate depth when there's nothing left but the thought of death. In verse 11, my days are like an evening shadow. I wither away like grass. This is despair at its rawest form. This is a man that is being brutally honest with God about his feelings. Many of us have been there. Some of us might be there now. And you might wonder why God lets you come to such a point. See, I believe he uses these dark moments of our lives as a razor-sharp scalpel to cut away the cancer of sin that corrupts every part of our life and relationship. See, I wish that during those times that God wouldn't be silent that those times when I'm desperately pleading to God for answers in prayer, that he would speak. That he would at least tell me why he's doing what he's doing. I wish he wasn't so slow in responding to my frantic pleas for instant relief. Oswald Chambers calls this God's severe mercy. He lets us struggle so deeply that he might take us beyond the unhealthy desperation of verses 1 and 2, shallow desperation that only summons God to fix things in our lives so that we can go back to a pain-free living. And he brings us to this healthy desperation in verse 12 where we're driven to know God passionately and gain God's perspective on life. See, only when the focus goes upward to gain God's heart and then our focus begins to go outward to meet the needs of other people, will the inward focus of our self-absorption disappear and our despair along with it? Point number three. Prayers turn desperation into healthy deliverance. Prayers turn desperation into healthy deliverance. From verse 12 down to the end of the chapter, you can be sure that this man's trouble isn't over. The problem hasn't disappeared. He will probably never see Jerusalem again in his lifetime. Spurgeon never forgot the night at Surrey Hall. Its pain and its depression it triggered haunted him for the rest of his life. You know, there's some scars in our life that will never disappear. There's some thorns in our flesh that are with us that are never removed. But the afflicted writer of Psalm 102 is healed in ways that go beyond his felt pain. And along the way, you see God maturing him, 
you come to the end of the chapter, you see a mature man that the pain hasn't gone, but his perspective on life has changed. And some 2,700 years later, we contemporary sufferers find medicine for our souls in the struggles of this anonymous Jew, we don't know who wrote this, that we'll never get to know or get to thank until we get to heaven. But with him, we find the greatest deliverance of all by, number one, resting in the sovereignty of God. Here's how we find deliverance. We rest in the sovereignty of God. In verse 12, he says, You, O God, are enthroned forever. The beginning of healing is to rest in the sovereignty of God. See, when we understand that he sits on the throne of the universe, we begin to be able to relax. When we understand that God is God, that we're not. When we understand that he reigns, he's in control, that he reigns over all things. He reigns in every situation. He reigns in the best and the worst that happens to us. He reigns over his friends and he reigns over his enemies. That he reigns in heaven and he reigns in hell. He reigns over those who doubt him and he reigns over those who love him. He reigns over those who follow other gods and he reigns over those who say, I love Jesus and no one else. He reigns completely. He is in absolute control of every situation of our life. The Word of God says not a hair of your head falls without Him knowing. He's in control. Our God reigns. See, the world doesn't yet see it. And often we as His followers have trouble believing it because we don't see it either. But the truth remains and it will never change. Our God is in control. He is sovereign. He reigns. He is in control of our lives. You can just rest in his sovereignty, but you can also rest in his timing. The afflicted man prays with calm assurance in verse 13. He says, God, you will arise and have pity on Zion. It is the time to favor her. The appointed time has come. See, God has appointed a time for everything. Nothing will take place in a second beforehand or a blink of an eye later. Let's be honest. Some of you are worried that Donald Trump might actually be a candidate for our next presidency. God's not worried about that. Are you losing sleep over your finances? He's in control. Are you losing sleep over relationships? He's in control. Are you losing sleep over what your semester looks like? Can I encourage you? He's in control. Are you worried about the sickness of a loved one? He's in control. Are you worried about what tomorrow holds, whether you'll find a job or not find a job? He's in control. Are you worried about your marriage? He's in control. Are you worried about your children? He's in control. Stop worrying. Instead of running from God, acknowledge that you serve a God who cares about the details of your life. Peter would write, cast all your cares upon him. Why? Because you serve a God who cares for you. You serve a God who is intimately involved in the details of your life. He loves you. Acknowledge that he is sovereign and in control of your life. You know, even the tragedy of Surrey Music Hall and the destruction of Jerusalem that the psalmist laments about are within God's sovereign will and control. Rest in the lordship of God. Find your healings in the word of our, words of our Savior when he would pray, Father in heaven, not my will, but your will be done. We can rest in knowing that our God is sovereign and in control of our lives. Number two, we could rest, we could trust in the compassion of our God. We could trust in the compassion of our God. In verse 14, the afflicted man appeals to God to restore Jerusalem. 
He reminds God that he feels great compassion for the devastated city. He goes on to beg God to restore his beloved city to glory. And in verse 17, he ends with these words regarding God's response to the prayers of the destitute Jews. He says he regards the prayers of the destitute, does not despise their prayers. God cares about the things we care about. He's moved by the things that move us, especially when they line up with the things that move him. We can trust in his love for us when we pray for his goodness in areas of our lives that are so devastated. Number three, know that God will maintain his glory. The psalmist is so confident in verse 19 that God will look down from his holy mountain, that from the height From heaven, the Lord will look down on the earth. He declares boldly in verse 20 that God will hear the groans of the prisoners, that he will set free those who are doomed to death. He will release those who are condemned. In verse 18, he says that God will do so, this for future generations, those who are not yet created, that they may praise his name. He repeats in verse 21 and verse 22, he says, so that this future generation may declare in Zion the name of the God and in Jerusalem his praise when people gather together in his kingdoms to worship God. He knows that even if he doesn't see it in his lifetime, that God will always be true to his promises. That there will be a day coming, there's a new Jerusalem that will descend And the only true anointed one will come in the clouds of the air with a shout of triumph. And all the nations of the earth will gather before God. And every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. See, I can rest in the fact that all of creation, including myself, will be restored to full healing. Because I know that nothing will stop God from being glorified. In everything. And finally, number four, we can count on God to keep his covenant promises. We can count on God to keep his covenant promises. In verse 24, the psalmist returns to an earlier thought that his life was like going up in smoke. He desperately wants to see Jerusalem restored before his death, but then he remembers. And in verse 25 and 26, that even though he withers away like grass and the world is in flux and he's not in control of the world, he knows that God is, that God never changes. He cries out in verse 27, you're the same. Your years have no end. And suddenly, for the psalmist, it's okay. It's okay if he doesn't see Jerusalem restored in his lifetime. It's okay because he remembers that God has made a covenant. That God has made a promise. And that his character is unchangeable. That if God said it, you could take it to the bank. Because that's who God is. He never changes. And even if the exiles of his generation never see Jerusalem restored, their descendants will. Why? Because God keeps his covenants. And just as importantly, he has found healing in the struggle of the dark times. This man that began a prayer in self-desperation, completely focused on himself, now looks upward to rest in the character of God. And he looks forward to celebrate the joy that others will have in seeing their city restored. You know, he never found the healing that he asked for. He never found the healing that he cried so desperately for. But he discovered a healing far more spectacular. And listen, so can we. Only when our focus is upward, not inward. See, as long as we focus on ourselves, we'll never see what God's doing around us. We'll never be able to trust that he's in control when we're so consumed with ourselves. He is faithful to his promises. Whatever he has promised, you can count on.